Hello, kitties. Be sure to subscribe. And click that bell. Yeah, yeah, Freddy, yes. Click the bell, that way you know of all the new Slasher Mayhem brewing in the 80s Slasher Library. And click that like button, or I'll make sure you never have pleasant dreams again! And be sure to follow the 80s Slasher Librarian on Twitter. Join the Facebook group and the subreddit. The links are in the description below. Join now, or play time will be over. <laughs> this upload is brought to you by the patrons of the 80s Slasher Librarian. Alleyway, Bonanza Jellybean, Bree, Carl Leakin, Cecilia Spears, Allison Seib, Hawaii, Iron Alexa, Jay Gardner, Catherine McClear, Kristen Kay, Lauren Vaught, Liam Anderson, Michael, Ryan Woodward, Sean Campbell, William Schaefer, and Willow Ravenwood. If you would like to support the 80s Slasher Librarian YouTube channel, then check out the merch store and the Patreon page. Links in the description below. Friday the 13th, the novelization of the film by Simon Hawk. Chapter 2 As Annie's life was ending in the woods about three quarters of a mile from Camp Crystal Lake, Ned Rubenstein felt that his was just beginning. He turned right at the intersection of the crossroads and gunned his brand new Chevy pickup down the country road. The cab was filled with bluegrass music from the tape deck and the interior still had that new car smell. The truck was a present from his father for having made the honor roll every year since he had started high school. Ned was always goofing off and his father had made the promise easily, never dreaming Ned could actually pull it off, but he had underestimated him. The deal was that if Ned buckled down and worked hard for four years, he'd get a new car for graduation and be allowed to attend the college of his choice. That was all it took, a little motivation and it hadn't been that difficult to do. His reward had been a brand new red Chevy pickup with a white camper top and a killer sound system. And in the fall, he'd be heading out to California to start school at UCLA. He couldn't wait. He was already dreaming of the beach at Malibu, thinking about the girls he'd meet and the connections he would make in UCLA's film program. He'd already had a half dozen t-shirts made, all different colors all bearing the same legend. Why grow up when you can make movies? Add a couple pairs of jeans and some new Reeboks, and there was his college wardrobe. Now all he had to do was kick back for a few lazy weeks in the sticks, take some little kids on nature hikes, and teach them swimming and archery. Then mellow out around the campfire after they had all gone to bed, drink a few beers and smoke a joint or two while he dreamed California dreams. Everything was great. All it would take to make it a perfect summer would be meeting some foxy girl up at the lake. Jack, on the other hand, wasn't taking any chances. He had brought down his own. He and Marcy were sitting in the back of the big cab making out. They had been inseparable all through their senior year and had signed up as counselors together so they could spend the summer with each other before going off to different schools in the fall. Outwardly, they both talked about keeping the relationship going, but realistically, they both realized the odds of remaining a couple were slim once they started college in different states and started meeting different people. Consequently, there was a last-minute urgency about them. They were like a bomb getting ready to go off. Ned glanced up in the rearview mirror. Hey, Marcy! She broke off their kiss long enough to acknowledge his presence. What? Ned grinned. You think there'll be other gorgeous women at Camp Crystal Lake besides yourself? Marcy laughed. Is sex all you ever think about, Ned? Hey, no, no, absolutely not. Ha! Huh. Jack made a face. Sometimes I just think about kissing women, actually, Ned said. He couldn't resist rubbing it in a little. He knew that Jack and Marcy hadn't made it yet. Jack had confessed as much to him one night over a few beers. It drove him crazy. Marcy apparently kissed like a nuclear reactor melting down, but always drew the line at having sex. Jack claimed it was one of the things he really liked about her. Ned remembered the time that Jack brought up that particular moment. Now wait a minute, wait a minute, he had said. Let me get this straight. It's driving you crazy that she won't sleep with you, and at the same time, the fact that she won't have sex with you is one of the things you like about her? Jack had taken a long swig of beer and grinned. Yeah, I guess it does sound sort of weird, doesn't it? But think about it. 
If a guy wants to get laid, there's a lot of girls around who wouldn't mind at all, but I don't want to pressure Marcy. If you love somebody, you don't pressure them. Love is about trust, man, not lust. Yeah, but it uh, sounds to me as if you're suffering from a bad case of both, Ned said. Love and lust. <laughs> Look, I love Marcy, all right, said Jack. And if you love somebody, I mean, if you really love them, and you're not just bullshitting yourself, you don't try to jump their bones just because you're horny. If that's the bottom line, then you're not making love, man. You're just using someone else to get your rocks off. If you're that cheap and sleazy, you might as well whack off. At least you don't have to buy your right-hand dinner. I mean, come on. If you're doing that to someone else, you're lying to them, man. And chances are that if it's that easy, they're probably doing it to you. That's not being in love. That's just being selfish. Goddamn, Jack, Ned said, grinning. Ain't you a romantic? So you think that's funny? What the hell's wrong with being romantic, man? Maybe if more people were romantic, they'd stay together longer. Well, that's what you say, said Ned. But is it uh, what you truly believe? This is going to be your last summer together, man. It's got to be now or never. I know, said Jack, staring miserably into his beer. I know. You don't have to tell me. They pulled off onto the dirt road, marked with a new sign that read Camp Crystal Lake. Ned slowed down and followed the winding dirt road through the trees until they came to a larger sign saying, Welcome to Camp Crystal Lake, established 1935. A lean shirtless man with eyeglasses and a mustache was swinging an axe, leaning into it as he chopped at the roots of a large tree stump. Ned pulled over and parked. Hey, you want to give me a hand over here? The man yelled as they got out of the truck. Sure, said Jack. The shirtless man turned and called toward one of the cabins. Alice! A pretty young blonde woman came out carrying a broom. I want to get this tree stump out, the man said to them. Get on this side, you pull on that side, and I'll uh, pry on three, okay? Alice! Coming! Shouted the blonde, hurrying over towards them. He counted off and they all put their backs into it. The stump resisted for a moment, then it went over and both Jack and Ned stumbled back slightly as it gave way. That's great, said the shirtless man, taking off his work gloves. He offered Jack his hand. I'm Steve Christie. Jack Kendall, uh, this is Marcy Gilchrist. Hey there. Ned Rubenstein. Welcome to Camp Crystal Lake, said Steve. Uh, this here's Alice. Hi, the blonde woman said, smiling at them. Uh, Steve, Cabin B is all ready. Oh, good, said Steve. Where's Bill? Has he finished cleaning out the boathouse yet? I don't know. I haven't seen him in the past half hour. Oh, said Steve. I wanted him to start painting right away. Ned glanced at Jack and Marcy. What the hell was the rush? Well... What about Brenda? You told her to go set up the archery range. Said Alice. No, no, said Steve. I'd rather she paint. He turned to face the others. Well, come on, let's go. He clapped his hands together and rushed off somewhere like a man trying to get ten things done at once. Ned looked at Alice with bewilderment. I thought we had two weeks, he said. Alice laughed. Come on. I'll show you where you can stow your gear and get changed. They barely had time to put on shorts when Steve Christie came back, detailing jobs like a drill sergeant in a boot camp. He seemed hyper and nervous, anxious to get everything done right away. And as fast as they worked, he thought of new things that needed to be done immediately. He kept pulling out an inventory he had made up of items from the hardware store in town. It seemed that he'd bought out their entire stock. Ned began to feel that by the time the kids arrived, they'd all be utterly exhausted. They swept out cabins and replaced door hinges, painted trim and put new putty around the windows, installed signs on buildings with drills and wood screws, chopped firewood, installed ore locks on the rowboats, cleaned the bathrooms, and generally ran around like squirrels storing away nuts for the winter. And they had just got there. Had they known about the history about the camp and Steve Christie's personal problems, they might have understood his anxiety. 
As it was, they were having reservations about the laid-back summer they'd been hoping for. If this was any indication of what they would expect, it could turn out to be a real hassle. Who the hell needed a camp director who thought he was a troop commander? Still, the work needed to be done, and setting up a camp properly always took a lot more time and effort than running it did. The sooner they got it done, the sooner they'd be able to relax. For the time being, they decided to give Steve Christie the benefit of the doubt. But he did seem awful nervous. They broke for lunch, sandwiches and chips, which Alice threw together because the new cook hadn't arrived yet. Steve took another trip into town to pick up more supplies. It hardly seemed possible that it was only lunchtime, considering all the work they'd done, but they were making rapid progress. Even Steve started to relax a bit once he saw how good things were going. He set down a box and helped Alice balance a rain gutter that she was attaching to the roof. Here, let me give you a hand with that. Thanks, she said, speaking around the nails in her mouth. She needed three hands to balance the gutter, keep her own balance on the ladder, and hammer in the nails. They were all getting tired. Got it? I got it. Alice drove the nails in, climbed down, and moved the ladder. Steve picked up a sketch pad she left lying on the deck in front of the cabin. He flipped the pages slowly. They were drawings she had made at the campsite of the lake shore and of him. You draw really well, he said. Thanks, she said. I wish I had more time to do it. Take the hint, Steve, she thought. For God's sakes, relax a little. When did you do this? Steve said. Last night, she said. She started hammering nails again. Steve stared at the drawing she had made of him. Do I really look like that? She glanced over her shoulder. You did last night, she said. She took the remaining nails and started pounding them in, then climbed down the ladder. You've got real talent, said Steve. The conversation seemed awkward somehow. After she'd brought up last night, you know, they'd been alone and had done a lot of talking, but nothing had been resolved. She didn't really understand his need to go through with this. As far as she could see, the camp was nothing more than a white elephant. Steve had a real problem with it, and she had problems of her own, of which Steve was one. He insisted on getting the camp started up again, fixing it all up and making it a going concern. He said it was to prove that the story about the place being jinxed was nonsense. That once the camp was all fixed up and it had a good season, it would be easier to sell it. But she had the feeling that it was much more than that. He had to prove something to himself as well. Prove that not only was there no curse on the camp, but that there was no curse on the Christie family either. The place had ruined his father, and he was obsessed with the idea of making a go of it, succeeding where his father had failed. This isn't really your cup of tea, is it? Steve said. He'd been hoping that she would get caught up in the spirit of the whole thing, that helping working together would help bring them closer. But she was only going through the motions. Maybe that was the problem with their relationship as well. They were only going through the motions, and Alice had other options. She sighed and said nothing. Want to talk about it? It's just a problem I'm having, she said. Nothing personal, she added ironically. He took a deep breath. Do you want to leave? I don't know, she said. I may have to go back to California to straighten something out. Come on, said Steve. Give me another chance. Stay a week. Help me get the place ready. By Friday, if you're still not happy, I'll put you on that bus myself. All right, she said. Friday. Thanks, Alice. He started to turn away, then stopped, looked over his shoulder and said, Oh, do me a favor if you would. Check with Bill and see if we need any more paint. She stared after him in disbelief as he walked away, carrying the box from the hardware store. She was seriously beginning to wonder why he had wanted her to stay. Was it because they needed to see if they could work things out between them? Or was it just because he could use another warm body to get the camp ready? Well, she had given him a week. If he didn't come back down to earth and get his head straight by next Friday, she'd be on that bus. She'd turned and started walking through the trees, down toward the dock. She simply couldn't understand why this whole thing was so important. It was only real estate, after all. Granted, it wasn't exactly a booming area, but would it really make that much difference if there was a summer camp established on the property? 
If Steve wanted to sell it, why wouldn't he just put it on the market and let it go at that? He had argued that the summer camp would make a difference, a big difference. That it would turn a basically worthless piece of property into an income producing property, which would make it that much easier to sell. They had argued about it. She couldn't see his point. How could lakefront property be worthless? It isn't about whether or not it's income producing property, she had said. It's about the obsession of yours with the Christie family curse nonsense. That's what it's really about, isn't it? Don't be ridiculous, Steve had said. You know perfectly well there isn't any curse. That's right, she had said. I know it perfectly well, and you know it perfectly well. So why isn't that enough? Why do you have to prove it to the people in this town? Who cares what they think? It isn't that, Steve had said. You don't really understand. So explain it to me then, she demanded. I mean, what is it? You want to stay in Crystal Lake for the rest of your life and run a summer camp two months out of the year? For heaven's sake, Steve, write it off. Put it up for sale with an agent. Cut your losses and let's go do something with our lives. But it wasn't all that simple. Steve had unfinished business and he wanted her to wait and help him finish it. Meanwhile, she had unfinished business of her own back in L.A., and she wasn't all that certain she wanted to finish it. Maybe it was her business here with Steve. She could be finishing in any case. She had a week in which to make up her mind. Why did relationships have to be so goddamn complicated? Bill? She called out to the young man working by the dock and relayed the message from Steve, checking to see if they needed more paint. The paint's all right. I think we're going to need some more thinner, though. Okay. I'll tell him. She turned to go. Alice? Yeah? Did the others show up? Yeah. Everyone but the girl who was supposed to handle the kitchen. Annie? She said. Bill wiped his forehead with the back of his hand. You think we're going to last all summer? He said, grinning. I don't know if I'm going to last a week. She sighed. Bill laughed, but she didn't. She wasn't joking. Steve had phoned something else that absolutely positively needed to be done immediately and necessitated a run back into town. He had called an impromptu briefing around the Jeep and like a general making the rounds of his troops out in the field, he was issuing directives. Do you want that uh, listed separately? Said Jack, who had just been put in charge of inventory. That's right, said Steve. And Brenda, I want you to finish up that archery range, okay? Okay, she said, having already started the job several times only to be pulled off of it to do something else. Now, if Annie gets here, Steve continued, Get her started in the kitchen. Got it, Jack said. Do your best, all right, said Steve, sounding somewhat less than confident. He looked at the sky. I'll be back sometime this evening. It's supposed to rain like hell, so get as much done as possible. I don't want to get too far behind. Bye, said Brenda, as he drove off in his Jeep, wrapped up in his worries. She rolled her eyes. Uh, by the way, he neglected to mention that in town they call this place Camp Blood, Ned said wryly. Marcy made a face. Next they're going to tell us there's poisonous snakes in the outhouse, some crocodiles in the lake. Nah, said Ned. The crocodiles are in the cabins. Brenda grinned. They had found a tiny lizard in one of the cabins earlier that morning, a little salamander. But by the time Ned was finished, he had her half believing it really was a baby crocodile. They look like that when they're really little, Ned had told her. Cute and sort of harmless. I mean, look at it. Would you believe that tiny critter would ever grow up to be a crocodile? It must have been left here by some little kid who had it as a pet. She had stared at him, convinced that he was kidding. But he seemed utterly serious, and both Jack and Marcy were listening with perfectly straight faces as he continued. See? Ned continued. A few years back, it was like a big fad back in New York. All the pet shops were selling these little baby crocodiles, you know. Uh, you, you bought them for about $1.50 and put them in these little fish tank kind of things, like, uh, like I used to do with turtles. 
and uh, I'd feed him mealworms and little bits of hamburger and things like that. And it was kind of neat, like having a miniature dinosaur for a pet, you know. Only trouble was the cute little things got bigger as they got, who as they got older and they got bigger. And then they stopped being so damn cute. Started to look more like crocodiles, which is what they were, of course, and they started to get teeth. Lots of sharp little teeth that could inflict a pretty painful bite. People didn't think, you know. I mean, it looks like a cute little lizard, but you'd think people would realize that they grow up to be crocodiles. Only they didn't. And like I say, it got to be a fad. All these little kids had had to have them because their friends had them. And just like that, as they got bigger, they started to get nasty and bite the kids. And so the parents just took them, flushed them down the toilet like you would a dead goldfish, except the baby crocodiles didn't die when they got flushed down that toilet. They went down into the sewer system under the city streets where it was warm and there was all sorts of garbage floating around for them to eat. And they just kept on getting bigger until there were these full-grown crocodiles down there living in the sewer system, surviving on the garbage down there. The way people found out about it is that several workmen who went down there to work on the sewer pipes got killed, you see. They'd be standing there in their waders working on a pipe or something, and all of a sudden this log would come drifting up. Only it weren't a log. And the next thing you knew, it had a hold of them and was dragging them down underneath that filthy water. And that would be the last anyone would ever see of them. It got to be such a problem that the unions went on strike because none of the workmen wanted to go down there. The sewers being infested with full-grown crocodiles who would take your leg off with just one snap of their jaws, you know. The governor had to call in these special teams of Navy frogmen to go down there and hunt the crocodiles. Only it's hard to kill a crocodile with just a spear gun, and there were so many of them down there that a lot of these Navy guys just got chewed up to pieces. So then they called in the National Guard, and what they did was go around the city and lift up every manhole cover they could find and drop hand grenades down in there. Jack and Marcy couldn't hold it in any longer. They both started laughing, and Brenda realized that she'd been had. Jack and Marcy, who both knew Ned from school, were used to him doing things like that. He could tell the most outrageous stories with a straight face, probably from his southern raising, just making them up as he went along, seeing how far he could push it before people realized he was pulling their legs. He was a real screwball that way, always goofing off. But the work that morning had gone a lot easier with him around, keeping things light. It hadn't taken him long to realize that Brenda was a sucker for a straight face and an outrageous line. And she had immediately become his favorite mark. But she didn't really mind. He made her laugh. It was a big improvement over most of the guys she'd known, who were always so concerned with coming on strong and cool to impress her. Ned's sense of humor impressed her much more than some guy cruising her like a macho jerk. She'd had more than her share of those kind. She opened the door of the prefab storage shed and took out one of the straw archery butts. Earlier that morning, she'd slipped the new targets on over the straw butts and screwed the tripods together. So now all she had to do was carry the targets onto the range. She picked up the target. It was awkward to carry, though not very heavy. She walked out to the range with it where she had already set up the tripods. She hung the target on the tripod and stepped back from it a pace, brushing a few stray pieces of straw off of her shirt. Suddenly, an arrow hissed right past her and thudded into the bullseye of the target, missing her by only a foot. She couldn't believe it. She turned to see Ned standing a short distance away, holding a bow and several arrows. Ta-da! He sang out, giving her a little bow. She stared at him with disbelief. Are you crazy? Want to see my trick shot? He asked, grinning and fitting two arrows into the bow. It's even better. I don't believe you. He dropped his lip in a Bogart sneer. You know, you're beautiful when you're angry, sweetheart. Yeah? Yeah, he replied. Did you come here to help me or scare me to death? She grabbed the arrow he had shot and went after him with it. He laughed, retreating from her in mock terror. Ned, if you do that again, I'm going to take you up on the wall to dry. God, I love it when you talk sexy, he laughed. She gave up. She just couldn't stay mad at it. Between the cornball lines and the ridiculous delivery, there was something about him that simply got to her. She didn't know what the hell it was. He was like an unruly little kid. She wanted to grab him, pull down his pants, and spank him. Pretty kinky, Bren, she thought. 
Dad or the guys bringing out your maternal instincts. Watch out, could be trouble. The guys who were really dangerous were the ones who could sneak in past your defenses, and Ned was already halfway there. She felt strongly attracted to him in spite of herself. He helped her finish hanging the targets, then they went back to the cabins to change into their bathing suits and finish working on the dock. Ned kept them all in stitches, doing his impressions of Steve Christie as the camp commandant, waving his arms around and barking out orders in that deep, raspy voice as they pushed the last piece of dock into the water and secured it. All right, all right, move it out there, a little to the right, a little to the left, move it out, move it out, okay, a little to the left, no, 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 you, okay, you're okay, nope, not you, a little to the right there, okay, now a little to the left. Marcy gave him a push, and he went into the lake with the screen. Alice jumped in as well, followed by Brenda, and by unspoken communal consent, all work ceased as of the moment whether Steve liked it or not. They were going to take a break. All of them had been working non-stop since they arrived, and they deserved some time to themselves. The sun was high and the water was cool, and Steve Christie was in town probably cleaning out the hardware store again and thinking of more things for them to do. They had accomplished a lot in one day and the rest could wait. Might as well cool off and catch some rays before it started to get dark. Treading water by the dock, Brenda stared out across the lake. She thought she had seen something move on the other side. She grabbed hold of the dock and squinted hard at a stand of trees on the opposite shore. What's the matter? Marcy asked. She was lying on the dock, and now she stared in the same direction. Do you see something? No, said Brenda, turning away with the shrug. No, nothing. She glanced back over her shoulder, frowning. All of a sudden, she had the strangest feeling they were being watched. She wasn't sure what had made her turn to look across the lake, but for a moment, she thought she had seen a figure standing back there in the trees. Now there wasn't anybody there. There was only a tingling sensation at the back of her neck. It's probably Ned, she thought. He's got me all jumpy with his sneaking up on people and all his talk of poisonous snakes and crocodiles in the lake. Something grabbed her leg. She screamed as Ned broke the surface of the water right beside her, making a snapping sound with his jaws. Ned! I'm getting you, he said ominously. Very slowly, she splashed him and he laughed and pushed off the dock. She made a face at Marcy. Much as she hated to admit it, he was getting to her. Instead of being annoying, his juvenile behavior was sort of cute. He was like a little boy, throwing spitballs to get attention. It was like having Jerry Lewis getting a crush on you. It was both maddening and enduring at the same time. Marcy sighed and stood up. The sun was getting low and she still had a few things left to do. Hey, you guys, she said. You ready to get back to work? Jack groaned and turned over on his stomach. Yeah, said Bill, sounding considerably less than enthusiastic. Uh Uh-oh, said Alice. She was staring at the water. Ned had swam a distance from the dock and he was suddenly thrashing weakly in the water. Help, he shouted. Help! There's something wrong with Ned, said Marcy. They saw him go under. Get a life preserver, Jack shouted. Bill leaped into the water and Jack dived in after him, both of them striking out towards Ned. Marcy and Brenda pushed a boat into the water. Alice threw out a life preserver. Jack was treading water at the spot where they had seen Ned go down. Bill was underneath somewhere looking for Ned. He came up beside Jack and took a deep breath. Did you see him? I don't know. Uh, He's around here somewhere. I'm gonna help dive for him, said Alice. She went over the side of the canoe as Marcy paddled out to where Jack and Bill were looking. There he is, cried Marcy, pointing. Brenda had come up with her arm around him. Ned was limp. Come on, guys, help me, she said, struggling to pull him towards the dock. Watch his head, said Marcy. Alice was beside her in another moment, and then Jack and Bill were helping to bring him in and lift him onto the dock. He appeared to be unconscious. They laid him down on his back, his head hanging to one side. Brenda crouched over him. Can you give him mouth to mouth? said Jack. Yeah, said Brenda. She turned his head and opened his mouth, putting one hand on his jaw and clamping the other over his nose. She checked to see if there was any obstructions in his mouth or if he had swallowed his tongue. 
She took a deep breath and placed her mouth over his, then exhaled slowly. Come on, Nettie, come on, said Jack, bending over and staring head on with concern. Come on, buddy, come on. Suddenly, Ned's arm came up to embrace Brenda, and she felt his tongue enter her mouth as he pulled her down on top of him. She pushed him away, slapping at him. Oh, Nettie! Oh, Jesus Christ, said Jack. Marcy shook her head and rolled her eyes at Alice. Ned stared up at Brenda with a pouting expression on his face, and she stared down at him, hands on her hips, angry with him, but also trying to suppress a giggle. She turned away so he wouldn't see her starting to lose the battle, and just for a moment she thought she caught another flicker of movement on the far side of the lake. There was someone watching them, she thought, not really certain if she had glimpsed at a dark figure ducking back into the trees, or if it was only a trick of the light or her imagination. Maybe it was nothing. Maybe it was one of the townies hoping to catch them all skinny dipping and getting a cheap thrill. She looked back at Ned. The others had all gone back to change, and Ned just sat there looking at her uncertainly, with that little, boy, I hope she isn't really mad, expression on his face. She sighed. What do I see in this guy? She asked herself. Now she was a little sorry she had pushed away from him so soon. It had been sort of nice. He got up looking contrite. She shook her head. Oh, come on, she said, heading back toward the cabins. As they left the dock, she looked across the lake once more. She didn't see anything, but she couldn't shake the feeling that there was someone there, watching, watching and waiting. Okay, Slashaholics, you've just heard an early access upload from the Patreon page. On Patreon, you'll get early access to this book and others to be named in the future, all great slasher novels. All early access titles on Patreon will have weekly chapter uploads that premiere on Patreon two to three weeks before they make it to YouTube. So, if you want to have early access to Friday the 13th by Simon Hawk, head on over to Patreon. Thank you all so much for listening. Hope you're enjoying this book so far. And as always, pleasant dreams!